Ever since I was a child, I had always dreamed of owning a home, a sanctuary for my family that we could truly call our own. So, when I stumbled upon an ad on Craigslist for a beautiful house in Kansas City at a price that seemed almost too good to be true, I couldn't believe my luck. The seller, a man named Mark, seemed friendly and responsive over email, explaining that he had recently moved out of the country and needed to sell a house quickly, hence the low price. I was cautious, of course, having heard stories of scams and fraudulent listings, but Mark provided me with pictures, documentation, and answered all of my questions in a timely and thorough manner. After a few days of correspondence, my family and I agreed to purchase the house. Mark instructed us to wire the money to a bank account, and once the transaction was complete, he sent me a text message letting us know that the front door was unlocked and we could move in right away. He also advised us to change the locks as soon as possible. It was a little odd, I thought, but I figured it was just a precaution. We were grateful to Mark for making the process so smooth and easy. The house was everything we had hoped for and more. It was a spacious, two-story home with a large backyard, perfect for our two children to play in. The interior was well-maintained, and we spent the first day moving in our belongings and getting settled. That night, as we sat down for dinner in our new dining room, we toasted to a new beginning and the bright future that lay ahead. However, our happiness was short-lived. Two days after moving in, we were startled by a loud knock on the door. When I opened it, I was met with the stern faces of two police officers and a man who introduced himself as the real owner of the house. Confused and frightened, we listened as the man explained that he had been out of town for a few weeks and had just returned to find us living in his home. He had no idea who Mark was and had certainly not authorized him to sell a house. We were in shock. I showed the police and the man all of the correspondence I had had with Mark, the documents he had provided, and the bank transaction details. It was clear that we had been victims of a scam. The real owner, although sympathetic to our situation, asked us to leave immediately. With heavy hearts, we packed up our belongings and left the house, devastated and embarrassed by what had happened. We reported the incident to the police and contacted our bank in an attempt to retrieve the money we had wired, but it was too late. The account had been emptied and Mark was nowhere to be found. We later learned that he had used a fake identity and had pulled off similar scams in the past. We were heartbroken and financially ruined. As we moved into a small apartment and tried to pick up the pieces of our lives, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The experience had left us traumatized, and we were constantly looking over our shoulders, wondering if Mark would ever be caught and if we would ever feel safe again. We had lost more than just money. We had lost our trust in people and our sense of security. It was a wound that would take a long time to heal. Weeks passed, and we tried to move on as best we could. The children started at a new school, and my spouse and I found new jobs. Life slowly began to return to some semblance of normality, but normality was a facade that crumbled one chilly evening when we received a call from the police. The detective on the other end of the line informed us that they had found something in the house that we needed to be aware of. Mark had installed hidden cameras throughout the house and had been recording everything that occurred inside. A chill raced down my spine as the detective continued, explaining that the cameras were live streaming to a remote location and they were still operational even after we had left the house. I felt a wave of nausea wash over me as I realized the implications of this new revelation. Mark hadn't just stolen our money, he had violated our privacy in the most intimate and unsettling way possible. We had been watched, our every move recorded and broadcast to who knows where. The sense of violation was almost too much to bear. I thought of our children, their innocent laughter and playful antics, all captured by the eyes of a stranger with malicious intent. The police assured us they were doing everything they could to track down Mark and bring him to justice, but the damage was already done. Our sense of safety and security had been shattered beyond repair. 
we no longer felt comfortable in our own skin, let alone in any physical space. The world outside seemed menacing, full of hidden dangers lurking in the shadows. In the wake of this discovery, we made the difficult decision to move out of state in hopes of finding some semblance of peace. We sold most of our belongings, packed up what little we had left, and headed for a fresh start in a new place. It was painful to leave behind the life we had built, but we knew it was necessary for our own well-being. As we drove away from the city, I couldn't help but glance back at the skyline one last time. It was a bittersweet farewell to a chapter of our lives that had brought us so much joy and, ultimately, so much pain. I couldn't help but wonder if we would ever truly recover from the ordeal, if we would ever regain the ability to trust others, and if we would ever feel safe again. It all started innocently enough, an ad on Craigslist promising a new look, a fresh start. Freddy's Hair Salon, expert haircuts and styling services, the banner read. The reviews were overwhelmingly positive, five stars across the board. I was on a budget and in desperate need of a change, so I figured why not. I reached out to Freddie asking for the location of her salon. She responded quickly with an address for her New Jersey apartment. I drove to her place on a cloudy afternoon, the kind of weather that holds a heavy promise of rain. Parking my car, I nervously made my way up the stairs to Freddie's apartment. As I entered, the first thing that struck me was the smell. A mixture of hair products and something heavier, something metallic. The living room was converted into a makeshift salon, complete with a styling chair and a vanity mirror ringed with bright white bulbs. The place was well lit, but there was something about the light that felt cold, synthetic. Come in, darling. Are you ready for your transformation? She asked while gesturing for me to take a seat. I took a deep breath tried to shove my nervousness down and settled in the chair. Freddy was middle-aged with graying hair and a bluish tint. She covered me in a plastic cape, fastening it tightly around my neck. So what are we doing today, she asked, combing through my hair with her long, spindly fingers. Just a trim, maybe some layers, I said, staring at my reflection. Freddy hummed as she started cutting. You know, I had another client earlier today. She wasn't happy with her haircut. Can you believe it? After all the years I've been doing this, some people still question my expertise. I watched the locks of my hair fall to the ground, a few inches shorter than what I'd wanted. Oh, um, that's unfortunate, I stammered. She paused, her eyes meeting mine in the mirror. It's more than unfortunate, it's disrespectful. I put a part of myself into each haircut, and when someone rejects that, it's like they're rejecting me. I swallowed hard. Well, I'm sure you did your best. Freddy smiled, but it didn't reach her eyes. Oh, I did. I certainly did. I watched as she continued to snip and cut, and my anxiety grew with each falling lock of hair. It was turning out far shorter than I expected. Almost a hack job. Finally, she spun me around to face the mirror and asked, Well, what do you think? My stomach churned. It looked awful. Nothing like what I'd requested. Yet, remembering her earlier words, I hesitated. It's not exactly what I had in mind, I finally admitted, my voice barely above a whisper. Her eyes narrowed. What are you saying? I'm saying I'm not happy with it, I mustered the courage to say. This isn't what we discussed. The atmosphere in the room shifted, turning palpably darker, her hands trembling ever so slightly. You're not happy with it? She repeated, her voice dripping with disdain. How dare you? After all the effort I put into this? I'm sorry, it's just not what I wanted, I stammered, my heart pounding in my chest. I should go. Oh, you're not going anywhere, she said locking the door with a click that echoed ominously in the room. Not until I make things right. Before I could react, she pulled a thin piece of cloth from a drawer and came towards me. My mind screamed. 
the walls of the apartment closing in like a trap. She came at me with a sinister grin, the cloth clenched tightly in her hand. I lunged for my purse on the adjacent chair, grabbing the pepper spray I kept for emergencies. As she reached for my face, I sprayed. She screamed, clutching her eyes, temporarily blinded. With my heart pounding like a drum, I unlocked the door and ran, tumbling down the stairs. As I sped away in my car, I realized my face was wet. I wasn't sure if it was from the rain or tears, but I was certain of one thing. I had narrowly escaped something far worse than a bad haircut. A week had passed, and I was scrolling through my news feed on my phone when an article caught my eye. A woman in the area had gone missing. Her friends and family last heard she was heading to a hairdresser she found online. My hands shook as I realized that could have been me.